Yeah, just wanted to uh, uh, first thank you for joining and for being here. As I mentioned, I'm super excited to see so many people from different places all over the world. And, you know, it's very cool that we are all gathered here for the same thing that is uh, interesting for you and for us and important, exactly like how we should engage uh, our tribe when it comes to uh, virtual events. And yeah, my name is Leah. Um, I'm a community manager at Archivive. This is a Viennese uh, AR startup. And I'm the host of the CMX Connect Vienna. Um, so the goal of the CMX Connect is that we uh, make this online or also like offline events where we can gather with other community professionals we can learn we can network and just also have fun um this is actually our third event and i'm very excited because this is the first event that we have uh, with a guest speaker with juan who is here today to share his year-long experience in the virtual event uh industry and sphere so yeah i'm very excited about everything that he has prepared for my, for us um, so yeah, I'll be also in the chat if you have questions, but I think uh, also Juan will be answering them. So yeah, uh, I don't want to take more of your time, Juan, so if you want, kick it off. All right, so thank you so much, Leah, for that intro and for the invitation. And so today we're going to focus on how to engage your tribe with virtual events, and I have to say, professional virtual events in the sense of having a virtual conference online. Um, but actually, how do we forget about the tech? We forget about working nights and weekends. You already have a busy, very busy schedule. And so what I want to do is actually simplify your life with creating events for your community that allows you to bring them together. So many times when we envision us like going live and having a virtual event, we think about, okay, the microphone and the YouTube style event or presentation uh, with the camera and the background and the lights. What happens is that as you start putting everything together, it becomes really challenging. The very, many, many different aspects to a virtual event that you need to combine um, along with the whole role that you have of leading your community. So just type a why for you if you feel like this when you have to do a virtual event. Like, do you feel overwhelmed? Do you feel struggling? You don't know what to say or how to say things. Just simply go ahead and type why on the chat so that I get a feeling on who's feeling a bit of it overwhelmed um, when you think about organizing a virtual event. Let's see. Yes, yes. I mean, definitely, if you're used to physical events, it's really challenging to go ahead and, and, and switch to a virtual experience where you have no feedback from the audience unless you have this interaction in real time. But something that is even crazier is that many platforms have a delay between what you're saying and when people see you. And so that makes it even more challenging because imagine that you say something and you ask a question and people only see you 20 seconds later and you're waiting there for 20 seconds for people to type. Like virtual events can be quite challenging. And part of what I want to do is actually not scare you, but on the opposite, simplify the whole experience for you. So who is this session for? Whether if you have an active community and you haven't done or you're planning on doing virtual events or simply you're just engaging with them with live video, maybe doing some interviews without actually having a two day virtual conference kind of thing. Um, whether, whether you have already done some virtual events or not, um, what I'm going to focus today is really more on the content side of what to deliver when you're putting together a virtual event or actually how to think about it. So in other words, if you feel overwhelmed by the tech and countless platforms and tools and options, that's definitely something that we can talk about. Also, if you feel paralyzed by the idea of all the work that this would add to your busy schedule, meaning organizing a virtual event, or if you struggle to get people to interact with you and the content, 
then you are in the right place because we are going to be solving some of those challenges. So for me, what is important is to help you out on how you should see the tech and how to make it work for you. The technology should not become a limitation, but on the contrary, how you can take advantage of it. Then how can you communicate things in a way that it easily attracts and connects with your members faster? Because believe it or not, you could be pushing people away. And then lastly, deliver events that unify your community and drive engagement. And I'll show you how you can easily put that together. So in other words, what I want to do today is I want to share with you three practical ways to increase community engagement with virtual events. And please make sure to stick till the end because I, um, I have a freebie for you. So what does it mean? How are we going to achieve this? Well, uh, for that, I'm going to cover three main points. And the first thing is how to make the tech work for you. And funny enough, it's not so much about the tech, but actually how do we approach the concept of a virtual event? Then uh, we're going to share about how to avoid pushing away your members. And for this, I'm going to focus on storytelling. And lastly, uh, we're going to look into how to empower your members to get active so that they can support you in the overall experience. Is that good? What do you guys think? Is this aligned with what you need, what you're looking for? Let me see. Is there something there that you would like me to address? Some concerns, some question that I didn't cover? Maybe something that we should quickly add to the content? Something that you're like, please, I must absolutely get an answer to my struggle right now. And it's not something I added there. I'm sure you had some expectations when coming here. So if there is anything, um, I know that uh, there's a lot of content. And for me, I had a meeting with Leah trying to compress it so that we make it as relevant as possible for you. So if there is something along the way that you have any questions um, or that it's not clear or maybe something that crosses your mind, as I say, some of the things uh, that I have prepared for you, just go ahead and share it in the, um, in the chat. Cool. So one thing that I think we need to address is the word engage. Um, because when we talk about engaging members, there's, there are different levels. I mean, it's not whether people are engaged or not, because people can engage in many different ways. And so I wanted first to define what engage means. And it is actually to occupy the attention of other people and their efforts so that they pay attention to you. So that means, for example, if you're multitasking right now and you're listening to this session as if it is a podcast, a live podcast, then I do have your attention. You're sort of here, not all the way, but you're still here. Now, if somebody is just watching and already turn off their phone and close everything, all the other apps, and you're really here and then you're in the chat, you're also engaged. And so I think that's important to keep in mind um, that we got different levels of engagement and any interaction, just already the fact that somebody is coming to your event says a lot, okay? And we should definitely take that into consideration as part of what we consider to have as engagement. Now, just keep in mind, and I made the, the, the comparison with Netflix, okay? Why? Because obviously there's a lot of virtual events out there. And one of the common things that people ask us all the time is like, we wanna have a virtual event, it's gonna be two full days and everybody will be there. And how do we make sure that people stick by the stage and you know watch every talk that we put together and so on? Netflix, that has the best writers, okay? Best storytellers right now. On average, they get about 3.2 hours of viewing time per day, okay? And these are this Netflix with amazing award-winning shows. So imagine us regular people putting together an event um, that we get other speakers that are also not on that level. Sometimes they are, yeah, but still, how do we manage to engage people? And so the fact that they already are with you um, says a lot. and 
what I'm going to share with you is with the goal of actually increasing that engagement once that they have come to your event. Okay, so just keep that in mind. A bit of my background. Actually, we run a production company here in Vienna, Austria. Uh, we've been doing virtual events for a while. Um, here with the team, we do anything from public organizations to bigger events, startup competitions, conferences, and so on. And what is also cool is that not only I get to be behind the stage, um, behind on the production side, putting everything together, but many times I also get to be in front of the camera as well and moderating the live streams for those events. And so there is a crew or there is a moderator for the physical participants and then I'm also for the virtual event as well. And so that gives me quite a unique um, experience when it comes to virtual events. Now, our company is called BSEEN and we are on a mission. We are on a mission to make it super easy for you to deliver professional and engaging virtual events without the stress of tech, hiring new people, adding crazy hours of work. I am not a techie. I am not a camera person. I am not behind the computers using the software. I don't get it. For me, what I love about is the concept, the content, my team are the experts and I have to learn because of the space in which we are. But I, I didn't start here. Actually, it all started because about 10 years ago, I had to deliver a presentation. It was a five minute presentation and I was about to collapse. I was so stressed because I couldn't speak in public. I was so terrified. And for two days, I was stressing out to the point that I asked a friend of mine to go and help me out for moral support. This thing went so bad that the moment I stepped on the stage, uh, my voice barely came out. I think we had less people than we have in this presentation right now. Uh, and I completely blacked out. Like my friend had to step in and finish the presentation for me. It was that bad. But um, that moment completely changed my life because I figure that if I wanted to be able to build a business and, and interact with people, connect with them, share my ideas, I, I knew I was in trouble. I knew I had to do something about my skills. And so I pushed myself to, to start speaking more in public and I tried to take every opportunity that I had out there. And it was, it was really challenging. People told me like, Juan, it's great to talk with you, but the moment you're on the stage is like, what's wrong with you? Like, <laughs> you're a completely different person. Um, but I pushed myself and little by little, I started getting better and I started getting better and I started getting invited to different places and even started to, to fly. So I'm based in Vienna, Austria. I used to live in Atlanta uh, in the US and I'm originally from Venezuela. So I started going to different places, the delivering presentation in front of people. In the end, um, I actually got to, got to make a living hosting events, moderating events. I've spoken in front of more than 10,000 people in more than 15 countries. And so it was really, really exciting to, to see the transformation and come out there and, and help people out. Now, along the way, in one of the events, this is uh, in 2016, I was working with these guys here in Vienna and one of the, the people in the team comes to me and says, hey, have you heard of Facebook Live? And I was like, no, I mean, what is that? And this is like one month after Facebook released the live option. So this is uh, 2016. And so the guys are like, hey, why don't we give it a try? We have this event going on, let's, let's stream it. And we literally took the phone, put it in the back of the room, and then we just went live and uh, like horrible audio, like you could see here, this is actually a screenshot of that video. Um, and it's still like on vertical form and then there on the stage, it was a start of competition. And the engagement was crazy. We had uh, 2000 views. I don't know if you can see it here. And we had like 12 comments and people are looking at it and they're engaging with it. It was so fascinating. By that time, I had been in a couple of different places and, and just the idea of live video, being able to connect with people from across the world and, and really bring in a whole different perspective on on content and give people access to um to you know content that they wouldn't have access otherwise um just a second i think my battery is gonna die why 
Uh, wait. Okay, now it's plugged in. Good. So that for me was fascinating. So I completely fell in love with the idea. I started looking around. Nobody's doing live videos. So I start going to different places. I mean, just to show you how excited I was about this. This is my actual wedding in 2017. I streamed it, of course. And we had 106 comments. It was so much engagement. It was crazy. So fast forward um, to two years ago, suddenly the whole world needed to go online. And uh, we were very well positioned because that's what we had been doing for a while. And so we started to deliver events um, across, uh, across uh, Vienna and we grew a lot. Now, to this day, uh, in-person events are coming back and um, things are sort of like going hybrid way. But I tell you, the data shows nowadays that people have experienced live video. 80% of people would rather watch a live video of a brand than read their blog, okay? 10 to 20 times more engagement, more people are, are watching longer uh, when you are using live video than actually a video on demand, okay? So the fact that you're live creates scarcity. It's about that moment right now where you can actually have an interaction. It creates a window of transparency. And that's why I thought it was so, so powerful about live video, because you're able to have a connection in real time. It doesn't matter where the person is and really create value. And so that's why I'm so excited about live video. Uh, and I'm so excited that you are here. And that's why I, every day, work together with the team to make it as easy as possible for, so that more people can use live video to engage with their communities, bring value, and grow their business. So before I get started, I just really want to ask you, like, if you have, like, please close your email, close your social, your phone, like, really focus on what we have here so that you can make the most out of this uh, session. It is being recorded, but you know how it is and how often really you're going to watch that replay. Maybe you may you have the time on the weekend and you do it, but obviously right now will be super useful because you can ask any questions that may come uh, your way as I'm sharing the content. And of course, like feel free to take notes, ask questions, screenshots, that's uh, sc like screenshots, completely fine, um, definitely not a problem <laughs> that's what my face looked like when i had <laughs> to speak in public too. it was terrifying i was really really paralyzed and to be honest to this day i still get a little bit like the goosebumps but you know it's only the first five minutes and then from there on um and i'll share actually on secret three i'm going to share a couple of tips for you to simply overcome those um those uh those like anxiety moments before going live but great, are you guys ready? I hope you are as ready as I am. I'm super excited to start going over the content with you. And so the first thing is secret number one, how to make the tech work for you. I think we all have that one trip that we did with our friends or maybe with a family that we went somewhere that completely left some life-changing memories. Uh, for me, it was actually... Um, a trip that I did across uh, my country when I was in high school with some friends of mine, where I got to experience everything that Venezuela had to offer and like things that I had never been before. And actually from my family, I've been to places where they haven't been. And that was always very rewarding for me and also with the friends that I, that I went with. And we all know that when we do those trips, we all come across situations that really make us bond because we get to experience things that we have never experienced before. We get excited about it. We build anticipation. You know, we're sharing maybe where we're going to stay together, how we're going to fly there, the whole planning process. Then finally we start going and then we go to places where we haven't been before, experience new things with people that we know but also we get to see them in a completely different way once we're experiencing those, um, those elements. And a virtual event is sort of the same way. 
That's why I was so surprised when I saw, um, and maybe you didn't have the chance to look into it, but the CMX Community Industry uh, Report for 2022 that just came out, where they asked people, what kind of platforms are you using for your virtual events? And I was so shocked to see that 70%, uh, 73% of people use Zoom, 13% of people use Teams, and about 14% use Hangouts. And the reason why I'm so shocked about this is because, yeah, in a way, it makes sense that people already know how to use these tools, and so maybe you use them all the time, so it's quite easy, and then people already have access to them. But if you're going to make a virtual event and you're going to make it in game, you're going to make it a unique experience for your audience, the last thing that you want is actually keep them in the place where they hang out every day. It's not the same if you have an experience in your, in your town in, like, in, with your friends in a place that you already know. It's not as valuable and as rewarding than if you go somewhere completely new. And so if you're doing virtual events in the common platforms where people are hanging out all day, where they're tired of being, you're going to damage the opportunity that you have to really engage them. And so the first thing that we need to look into is how do we get people out of the space where they spend most of their time? We need to get them out of there and into our own world. Otherwise, we can really establish a brand new connection where we get to create an experience for them. So a common pitfall of a virtual event is actually using Zoom or Teams or any of those tools that they're using every day. We actually need to look into a tool that is not common for them to use on a daily basis. Something that could have a bit of a wow effect where you can actually get them out of that space. Now, you don't need to go all the way to the to the other where you need to amaze them with virtual reality and like all these different studios. As I see, many, many organizations just suddenly end up developing virtual events within like something that looks like a TV studio. And I see that. And actually, that's not the whole point, because virtual events are somewhere in between. Yes, you need to have some quality audio. Quality, quality picture, you know, quality content, but you, didn't know, you don't need to go all the way to make it look like a, a TV studio. After all, you remember not watching TV anymore, right? Like you don't need that. The beauty of live video is where you have this authentic, unscripted nature. And that's exactly what you want to have with your uh, members and with your participants. And so already something like this is more than enough. Actually, one of the things that I love about virtual events nowadays is that because people are delivering them from like their home office or like their living rooms and so on, we actually built another layer of, of connection with people because we're welcome, welcoming them into our personal space. And that's, that's really unique. And so my recommendation to you is please try it if you're going to do a virtual event, use a tool that is not the one that they're using on a daily basis or the one that they used to work. And then don't, don't get so stressed out that you need to have this amazing studio set up in order to engage them. Just try to find proper audio, you know, microphone, try to avoid the one from the laptop, get a proper webcam with some, some, some lighting, and then you'll be more than fine. Yeah. Step two. Imagine that you're actually going on a trip with your friends and you start documenting the journey. You start building momentum. You start engaging. Hey, this is these are the speakers that are coming. This is uh, we had a conversation and this is what they're going to be talking about. This is how the venue is going to look like. These are these are how things are coming together. So build that anticipation with your uh, participants. And that's really going to engage them because it's going to build curiosity. They're going to want to know how things are going to play out actually during the event. OK, make it feel like you're in a journey together. I know, for example, that CMX, yes, they have their Facebook group where everybody's there, 
but for uh, their events, they actually have a separate uh, Facebook group for the summit where they engage with people that are coming to that event because we get to share a unique experience together. And that already builds bond, um, helps people bond faster. And the step three is don't try to replicate elements of the physical world in a virtual space. And this is very common, uh, especially, you know, you, you go to an event, uh, you see how they are, and you want to try to bring some of those elements into the virtual um, space. The reality is that you can't. Um, a virtual event is and needs a completely different form. People come to your virtual event because of different reasons. They have different expectations. They have different needs to those physical participants that go to a physical um, event. And, and I think the best way to explain this a little bit is let's take, for example, a, a soccer a football game, right? The content, the match, is the same, but there are many different ways in which you can consume the content according to the channel in which you find yourself. So you can go to the stadium and experience the game live. At the same time, you can watch it at home on TV. You can also go to a friend's house and watch the game there. You can go to the bar down the street and watch the game there. You could listen to it on the radio. You can just read the tweets, um, maybe online, right? And so that's at least six ways in which you can enjoy the same content, but then each experience is tailored to the channel in which people consume um, the game, right? And it's the same for your virtual event. Virtual events are consumed by people individually, watching by themselves, you know, you're also talking to one person. You're not talking to a, an audience because people are receiving the information by themselves. So you need to imagine that you're talking to one person that is sitting in front of you. And then understand that people may be multitasking just the same way as you're watching the game at home and you're also on your phone scrolling on Instagram and so on, right? And so we need to understand how people consume content online and why is it that they're coming to engage. So what does... TV do, for example, well, they have a, they have commentators and they have dedicated moderators that are different from the moderators in the, in the stadium. They have behind the scenes and they have interviews. And so they have put together a whole show where they combine the content from the match with other content to deliver it um, to their audience. And this is very important, for example, if you're going to go now and do hybrid events, in-person events where you have a physical audience and you have a virtual audience, you need to think about that it's not one event, um, but actually you're doing two events. You're doing a physical one and doing a virtual one, and you can take content from the physical one and then put it online. But the online audience needs to be engaged. They need to be addressed. You need to have a moderator. So if you're doing a virtual event, make sure that you have a moderator responsible for guiding them throughout the journey, um, throughout the whole day's experience. And then you create content that is focusing on the way that they're consuming that experience. So think about people who are by themselves watching um, the event while also multitasking. Good. So that's that's for secret number one. Uh, just quickly checking the chat here. Hear more about engagement opportunities. Look forward to catching up the recording. All right, Kali. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So secret number two. How to avoid pushing away your members? Pushing away my members, what do you mean, Juan? Well, for that, we need to look into storytelling and in particular, the hero's journey, okay? So this is actually coming from a book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces, written by Joseph Campbell. In 1947, Joseph Campbell looked into different stories throughout time and analyzed them and saw that there was a very particular pattern between them. He sort of codified it, put it into a framework, and he called it the hero's journey. And it looks something like this. In every story, there is a hero. The hero is at peace at home in their world. Suddenly, something happens that changes the status quo. Now, this hero has two options. Either they learn to live with a new reality, or they try to take action. 
And so they're wandering around. They, they think if they should do something about it or not. Do they have what it takes? They don't know if they have the skills. I don't know anybody. And eventually, as they look around, they encounter a mentor. The mentor is somebody like them who was in a similar position in the past. And it is the person that actually is going to give them the push, convinces them to take action. And so the hero goes into the unknown world because they have never been before. <clears throat> they didn't have this problem. So they have never gone through this experience on trying to solve this problem. But this is where they encounter many different challenges that maybe meet other people. They have a lot of ups and downs, a lot of self-doubt. Until finally, they come to a realization. They understand that they have what they what what they what they need to have. They have everything they need. They believe in themselves. They figure out a way to eliminate the problem. They take action, and then they live happily ever after. Now they come back to the place where they started, but they're a changed person. The place is not the same, but they have grown. They have grown through these experience, and that's why you see a lot of times in movies. Actually, pretty much almost. Every time in movies you have the hero, something happens, they encounter somebody, and then they go on this quest, this journey, sort of like, you know, a lot of the rings, they venture out there trying to figure out who they are um, throughout the journey. So the whole point why I'm talking about storytelling and why you should use stories and, and the whole point of taking a story and sharing it is so that your customers, your members are able to find themselves in it and take action. That's the whole reason why we use stories in business, so that people can find themselves within it and take action. Now, the challenge that we have here is how do we make sure that actually they connect and they, they resonate with the story rather than be pushed away. Because if you don't tell the story the right way, instead of attracting um, the listener to you, you're actually going to repel them. So how can you make sure that you don't repel them? Well, you need to think about the angle from which you tell the story. Because at the end of the day, in your member's story, in their journey, you're not the hero. They are the hero and you are the mentor. You are the one who needs to guide them and push them to take action. They have a problem that they're trying to solve. They're trying to figure out and they go on their journey trying to see what they can do about it. Now, it is through your products and services that you give them the tools to venture into this unknown world. For example, this talk today, you're wondering how you can be more engaging with your events, how you can connect with your audience. So you're trying to solve a challenge that you are experiencing. You look around, you come across this presentation. Now I'm sharing content with you. I become the mentor, you're the hero. And through this session, you get the tools that you need in order to continue your journey forward. And that, that is exactly the same thing for your members and their clients. If you are B2B, B2C, B2G, whatever market that you are in, that's gonna be the case as you move forward. So this is super important because many times, we just use language that puts us in the position of hero. And we are not looking for another hero. That's why we get repelled. We're looking for a guide. We want to be mentored. We want somebody to help us out, get to the next stage. We want to solve our own problem. So the most common pitfall in this case is positioning yourself as a hero of the story. So Juan, what would be how do I position myself as a hero? Like, I, I, I don't know how I do this. Well, when you're talking about, we have won so many awards. We have the best team. We do so many things. We invested so much in this product. So me, 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 me. You need to shift the way that you communicate and instead start looking from the side of your member. So step number one, use stories that support your lesson or your main idea, okay? Make sure that this story is connected with a struggle, a problem, 
or um, a desire that your member has. And step three, step three, behave as a member of your community while avoiding hero language. What do I mean by that? Is that try to put yourself in the shoes of your community member and then whether you're interviewing somebody or you're delivering a presentation, try to be as you would be one more member asking those questions uh, to that person that has the knowledge. Try to see if you can get that information out of them. And that would already help you avoid hero language. And there you have it. Secret number two. How's it going? Am I going too fast? Um, like, is, it, is everything clear? Do you have any questions? Great info. Like, I know I can get super excited about this and I just get going and like <laughs> deliver a bunch of information here. So I just want to make sure that I'm not, you know, overwhelming you with all this great info. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So let's go to secret number three, how to empower your members to get active. So one of the challenges that uh, that we see as community managers is how do we get people to engage? How do we get people to participate? How do we get people to share content? And one of the things that I see out there, and it's actually coming from my moderation side, because I, when I'm hosting an event, I need to take a group of strangers that have never met before and suddenly turn them into this one family, right? Like we need to get people interacting with one another, engaging and responding. And as I put together events and, and the content to deliver that event, there is a struggle that I see coming through. On the one side is the vision that I have for that group of people and how I would like them to connect with one another. On the other side, there is the organizers, there's a brand, there's a company, there's a voice. Maybe, uh, you know, if it's not your business, then there is uh, somebody above, somebody that has set some rules and then you need to fulfill that. And then it's also the way you are and like, how do you find yourself managing all these uh, different elements, right? Like, how do you come across and manage all these things? And what, I, what I've seen at the end of the day, as we go ahead and uh, work to build, like to bring our community together, is that whatever it is that you have planned, it's, that's the way it should be. Because you have a vision over your audience, over your community. You have a vision of what you're trying to build and what it is that they need. And so the most common pitfall that I see um, people when they're coming to engage with their audience is not take full ownership over the role that they have as the leader of the event or the moderator. It's being halfway and wondering, what are they going to think if I do X? Or what, how are they going to respond if I do that? Is, are they going to think this is stupid? This doesn't make any sense. They're going to judge me. The whole point is, is that if you are in that position, if you are in that role, it's because whoever gave you that position believes that you have everything that you need in order to engage with the community. It's because you am, uh, represent the values of what that community community should have. And so you should have that 100%. And I experienced this. I don't know if you notice in the pictures, but you have, I have their very complete different audiences. Like I have anywhere from students to uh, startups like Hackathon to CEOs and executive people. And they're all in the selfie with me. And the reason why I'm able to do that is because I take 100% ownership of the role of like, I've been given this, this task, and so I'm confident that, it, that whatever I do is because that's what, why I'm here. And so I try not to, to censor myself or, or, or you know, hold myself back, but on the contrary, I take ownership and then just go 100% in. And the way I do that is by accelerating the process 
um, of building trust with somebody. So when one of the common things that you know when sometimes you meet somebody that you feel like you have known all your life, well, that's exactly what you want to build here. Normally, relationships take time. And it is because we are shy and like little interaction. We need to then grow that a little bit more and we invest a little bit more and those touch points come a little bit more and a little bit more. When you're moderating an event, if you want to make it engaging, you need to accelerate that process and take that buyer down. So from the start, you need to behave as if you are in your living room with a group of friends that you haven't met yet. And you need to assume that these are people that you have known all your life because that's the only way that you're going to accelerate the trust building process with your audience. Otherwise, if, if you're shy, if you're, it's, it's a bit challenging, like it takes time to build up and to warm up, it's going to take a long time. And in a virtual space where people, all they need to do is click the browser X and that's it. They're out. There's no pain. Like, I don't need to walk out of a room where everybody's going to see me. You know, I can just simply walk out and nobody will ever see me. And they don't even know I was here. Then the most important thing is that you have full control of the space because it is your space. It can be whatever you wanted it to be. So if you, for example, you're here on this picture and you want to walk down the middle aisle because you want to be closer to your audience, then you're free to do that. If you want to ask everybody to stand up and start clapping, you are free to do that. And that's one of the most empowering things that when I'm doing um, communication workshops, people really open their mind because we many times go to events where the, the moderator never do things like that. And so we assume that we need to behave a certain way when we are leading the event. And actually the reality is, is that no, you don't have to. You can do whatever it is that you want because it is your space. It is your community. And so that's the biggest thing. And that's actually, believe it or not, secret number three. And so build trust fast by taking ownership over the environment. It can be whatever it is that you wanted it to be. Don, I know that when we're meeting somebody, we have all these layers that we want to go through in order to build that connection. But online, you don't have the time to do that. You need to accelerate the process. That's why it's really good to start to engage with people before your event. Don't, event, don't wait until your event to start engaging with people. Engage them in advance. And that's also going to help you feel more comfortable. Like if you're doing a physical event, talk to the people waiting outside before they go into the room. Engage with them, talk with them, get a couple of names. Then when you're on the stage and you see them, look at them. They'll smile back and call them by name. Start addressing them. Then other people are like, oh, they know other people in the room as well. Like, you know, why they don't know my name? I want them to know my name. And so you start building that connection. Step two, give authority and responsibility to your members. That's the other, the other thing. Many times we want people to engage, but we don't give them the, uh, the authority. So we give them the responsibility. And so, hey, yeah, feel free to ask questions. Feel free to engage. Uh, feel free to comment. But we don't feel that we have the authority. We feel we don't we don't feel like it is the right thing to do, or maybe we we hold ourselves back. And it is because we were not given the authority to also participate. So one of the things that you need to do is look at your most active people and then yes, give them the authority and the responsibility to take action. If they feel that they have the authority, if they feel empowered to be able to share and communicate, they will take on that. And so that's really important combined with step number three. And it is let them shine. Bring, shine a light on them, showcase them to the community, make them take ownership, give them their, the, the authority, and then shine a light. But most importantly, show them how. And I think that that's one of the key things is that, yeah, I don't know what a framework is. I don't know how I can contribute. I want to but I don't know if I can, I don't know what's the framework in which I can communicate. I don't know what is out of boundaries. And so you need to also define for them 
what it is okay so that they feel confident when they're saying things. They know that they're not going to get in trouble because they know that this is within the scope and what is expected from them. And that's actually how you empower the community to also bring more um, engagement. For example, many times when, I, when we do events, I find a couple of people before and I tell them, hey, make sure to share more in the comments. You know, like when you share, you, you know so much, people listen to you, you give me so much energy, make sure to share and, and clap louder and root. And then that stuff is contagious. People see that it is okay. So common pitfall here is if you're wondering about uh, how people re react or how you feel about what you do, you're going to constrain yourself and that's going to limit your range. And so people are going to lead the space. You brought them into your world by having a separate space, a different platform where they're not the one, there's not the one that they're hanging out all the time. You're communicating in mentor language. So they look up to you and they feel guided. And so for that, in order to bring the whole circle, you need to take ownership over your role and then really engage with them. Know that this is your space and it can be whatever it is that you wanted it to be. You have the power to create what you want it to be. There you have it. Secret number one, we discussed how to make the tech work for you. Secret number two, how to avoid pushing away your members. And secret number three, how to empower your members to get active. Now, I have a quick question for you. Um, I just want to share with you, is it okay if I take five minutes to walk you through the program that we have when it comes to virtual events? Is that Fine, I just want to give you an overview. Um, also, I'll be able to share a little bit more about common pitfalls when it comes to virtual events and also give you a framework on how you can put together a virtual event. Is that okay if I share that with you quickly before we wrap it up? Cool. All right, perfect. So um, we have a program that we take people through in order to launch a virtual event. And this is a hands-on program. It's a three-month program where you actually get to deliver your virtual event. Like we take you by the hand through every step. And so we have three stages and just take notes because this is pretty much what you can also use for you organizing your event, um, even if you don't go through the program, okay? So we got three stages, plan, prepare, and produce. When it comes to a virtual event, there is no, like room for improvisation is really small. So everything is happening before that event. And so in the planning stage, uh, the most common pitfalls are is that because people haven't delivered a virtual event before, you're not able to see how you can build a strategy around virtual events. Virtual events are not going to replace physical events. They're going to complement them. And so depending on the size and your budget and so on, what many organizations do is that they have a couple of virtual events leading to a main hybrid event or physical event. And so virtual events, if you know how to use them strategically, can really engage your community. The other thing is, how do you put together a program? and and what do you need to think about is that every virtual event, remember what we talk about, people come for the content. Your event needs to be a transformational journey. The person that comes to your event is different from the person that leaves your event, okay? So that's a common pitfall is not taking that into consideration when it comes to your virtual event. And the last thing is not understanding like, how is your structure? What kind of resources do you need? How should your team look like? Um, you know, how much time takes different tasks and so on. So whenever you sit down to start putting your virtual event together, you need to consider these um, on the planning stage to build your foundation. As you move forward, you go into the preparation stage. And actually this is where things start coming together. You need to think about the graphics, um, what kind of graphics do you need? How should be the visual identity of your event? Um, this is, um, quite important because you want to make sure that your social media and your registration and your virtual event 
have a unified design language. Also, like what kind of equipment did you have if you don't have any? Uh, putting together your registration page, what kind of tool do you use? How do you make sure that everything is set up? This is what you're going to think about there. And then coordinate production because pretty much after you design your program in step uh, two, you already need to start approaching speakers. Now, in reality, the speakers are not going to put together the presentations until like 10 days before your event, but it's important that they know that they need to talk at your event. And so you need to start like getting them in advance. And also um, the speakers are an amazing tool to get people motivated to sign up, right? And so that's why it's important that it happens in the beginning. And then during the preparation stage, you start coordinating them. And then lastly, on the production stage, now you are making sure that your speakers, you know, everything is ready to go, that they know how the tech works. For example, before this talk, I never used Bevy before, so I couldn't share my screen and like the 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 internet like the the tool wasn't taking the right camera and all these different things. So you obviously want to make sure that that stuff is handled in advance because believe it or not, two years of pandemic and many people <laughs> delivering talks online, we still have situations where like, can you see my slides now? Can you hear me now? You know, like oh my god, can <laughs> how does how does this work, right? In virtual events, the spectrum, you know, the tech knowledge is very different. So you want to make sure that you have brief everybody so that everybody can make the most out of your event. And then obviously you have um, the whole delivery of your event. You as the moderator, because you as community manager, you should be the host, not your CEO, not your boss. You are the face of the community, right? You're the face of the organization. You're communicating with your with your group, with the members, they know you. So you should lead them. Now, if your CEO wants to deliver a presentation, then that's a different thing. They have a session within your program, but you should definitely be the one to lead them. So you deliver your event together with your team. And then most importantly, like your event is going to take maybe one day, two days, three days. What happens with the rest of the time, you know? So how do you repurpose that content? You need to be strategic of that think about it and um, a little like behind the scenes or like pro tip. Um, you can also plan your agenda with the content that then you create during your event, but with the mind of using it after your event, right? Because you're live, you have the speakers. And so you know that you can create content there that actually the big focus is for repurposing later after your event to promote and, you know, engage with your community online. And so this is how you can easily put together a virtual event. Now, if you are interested or if you have questions, and this is the freebie I have for you, I'm offering you a free strategy session. You can go to bcinlife.com slash book. You can book a meeting with me, 45 minutes, completely uh, free of charge, just fill in the application after that. And then we can look into how can an event look for you? What kind of virtual event can you do? What makes the most sense? How would that strategy look like? Um, and see how actually you can use them in your, um, in your strategy. And well, if the program is a fit for you, then we can discuss that or at least point you in the right direction, because that is the key. And so if you are interested, just go to bcinglife.com uh, slash book. Please um, make sure to fill in the application, the questions there, because it allows us to hit the ground running. We only have 45 minutes. And so when we jump on the call, I want to make sure that I have a better overview of what you're trying to do, your experience and so on. And that way we can make it as effective as possible. That's it from my side. I'm leaving the website um, on the top there in case you want to go and check it out or if you want to look at it later so that you can book yourself. But with that being said, thank you so much. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to take them now. Amanda, I'm happy to hear that. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. I'm glad you were here and that it was useful. I tried to keep it exactly for the launch break. So I'm glad that worked out. Anybody else? 
Thank you, great presentation of ideas and strategies. Thank you for sharing. And so if you want to take it further and see how you can have um, a strategy may look like for you, really, uh, you're more than invited to go ahead and be seen live.com slash book. And there we can discuss it further how you can use virtual events to engage your community. Thank you very much for coming today. I really appreciate it. Um, I know that sometimes it takes a little bit to type the questions and so on. So maybe we can wait a minute um, to give some time if you're typing. Um, and if not, well, I don't know. Leah, do you have any questions? Um, questions for now, I'm not sure, but I just wanted to say, wow, <laughs> like it was so, so great. I, I took myself so many notes. I'm definitely going to use for our events. Like it was so insightful. So thank you a lot for doing it. Um, yeah, I think there is one question that maybe you can take on. But thank yeah. you. Thank you. And I'm glad uh, I'm glad it was useful. Definitely. I know you're doing uh, Instagram lives yeah. and some sessions into your Facebook group. So yeah, I hope that uh, that you see some of the content here, especially it's a lot of like mindset and how you see your role as actually the mentor of your tribe. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and that really changes the perspective. Let's see, almost Nani has here. Thanks for the session. The beginning of the session, you mentioned it's difficult to get the feedback. If it is not a physical event, so how would you suggest to cover feedback on a virtual event? Uh, well, depends. So feedback on real time, you see like how people engage, um, if they have any questions or anything like that. I think, um, you also have surveys that you can send to people after the event to, to get a better overview. You also can try to schedule some calls with people that attended the event to get their impressions. And that, that way, like an interview format where you can dig a little bit deeper on, on input that you would like to know. Um, normally, it also depends on what kind of feedback do you want to get, right? Like, do you have, like, do you want to, get more input about the tech side? Do you want to get more input about the technology? Do you want to get more input on, on the content? So that, that I would say is the first thing to figure out and not so much like open-ended where like, so what do you think, right? But more like, hey, do you, do you like the content? Do you have any ideas on how to make it better? Because that's the other thing, like people are not really trained on, on how to give feedback. We're not trained on how to ask for feedback. And so you definitely want to frame it in a way that you can get useful content that you can actually quickly implement. So, yeah, I mean, you, it's hard to get feedback because, for example, if, you, if it is a physical event, you can see how people body language, like body language and how they're reacting to what you're saying. Um, and it, it gives you a better overview. And that's part of the challenges of shifting to a virtual platform where all you have is a lens to look at. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, KPIs. Well, so on the one side, it depends on the platform that you're using. Many platforms have already like some kind of analytics uh, and may not be the same and how you use them. In the end, you know, it's all about how you turn them into, how do you turn the data into information? Like how do you apply that in your overall strategy? Um, metrics, again, if you're measuring content, for example, you're going to need different KPIs that if you need to measure tech side. So, um, for example, if you're looking into the content, you want to see when are, when are people dropping? Like, when are they losing interest? Um, which sessions are attracting more people? Like, who are more interesting um, people? Like, who have more questions? Who are more active? You know, um, think and keep in mind that many people are multitasking when they're listening to a virtual event. And so, you know, if you're sending emails, if you're listening parallel while you're doing something else and, and you ask people to answer a question, you know, many times people don't feel addressed personally. They think that, you know, there's a bunch of people watching, somebody else will answer, right? And so it's also hard to, to track these things. Um, but time, that would be a thing. Also, 
uh, from the tech side, was everybody able to join? Did they know how to access the platform? Like, did they were they able to watch the talks? Were they able to ask questions, or did they know where to go for questions and so on? So those those would be the KPIs that I I would suggest. I think a lot would be also conversion. So how many people do you reach? How many people sign up? How many people showed up? Um, how many people ask questions? What I find more interesting from a virtual event is actually the type of questions that people are asking, the type of comments that people are asking. That I find more insightful because it allows you to learn more about your community rather than how long did they watch a session um, or when, when did they you know, click out. Um, I actually have a question also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I think that also like for community managers, we yeah, often are faced with, you know, we are setting expectations of, you know, how many people will show up and then uh, what is going to be like the event with that many people when we prepare a bit for that. And then for, some, uh, for example, sometimes less people come or like very few people come. So we need to be more to improvise a bit more. So like how, what should we keep in mind when it comes to improvisation? Because I've seen, and I personally also experienced like when it comes to this improvisation part, sometimes you get a bit stuck and then, you know, the event is going on in other direction in that we didn't want to go. So yeah, how we can maybe manage that in a way that it keeps the engagement still high. Okay, um, so what do you mean improvisation? So, for example, when, you know, let's say you're organizing a networking event and, for example, many members are coming and they're expecting, you know, that they're going to meet many people, but then it's not like, for example, they're meeting less people than expected or maybe the people are not engaging, how are you real? somehow yeah like trying to engage them again and trying to not disappoint them i think this is also very important for us as community managers like how we don't disappoint people when they come that's so great um so only you know how the event is supposed to be participants don't know they don't know that it was supposed to be 300 people. They don't know it was that it's only 10. They have no idea, right? I also have a meetup that I host here. And sometimes I have 30 people. It's called the Vienna Pitch Training. Sometimes I have uh, 30 people, sometimes I have two. But people don't know. The people, when you have two, they don't know that you have had 30 people. They think that, okay, maybe this is how it is. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's the first thing. Like, only you know, and that's what I mean with, you go with what it is. Like, if you're delivering a presentation and your slides, you know, if the, the computer falls down, you shouldn't bring attention to that you just continue with your presentation, right? Because you're bringing attention where it is not necessarily needed. And so what happens is that you, ha you have expectations, your expectations are not met. And so suddenly now your self-confidence crumbles because you're like, oh my God, I don't have people. people. You think that they were expecting something and like you didn't deliver on that. And so you're underperforming. The reality is they don't know you know and so you just go along as if this is the environment that you have created so that's that's the first thing um the other thing is that yeah sometimes if you promise that we will have 10 people and you have two you have no control well you have certain level of control about the amount of people that show up but in the end like you know if it is a rainy day People don't show up. Like in my meetup, if it is raining, I for sure will have no more than five people. If it is a sunny day, I have 30, you know? So like, I have no influence over that. What you do have control 
over is, is that if little people show up, uh, it could be about your marketing channels, but at the same time, it could be that you're not creating enough interest with the way that you're naming things and your communication. So you're not creating enough tension with your participant. And we talk about this in the program and like, I give you all the tools on how you can create interest um, how, um, for people to show up and so on. But that's that's the first thing. And so the next thing is like improvisation. There is no need to improvise. I mean, you had a plan and you continue with your plan. Um, only you know these things. The audience doesn't know. This is part of like, just take ownership, go along and there's no need to bring attention to it. There's no need. Cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I feel that yeah. that's the thing that we forget that we know what the event is about and not the people who are coming to the event. Yep. 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 Like in this event, we never told them like how many people should be. They don't know if we plan 300 or we plan 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, something else? Let's see. I think you can keep going to this. Yeah. Uh, that, yeah, you could always have like, um, you know, plan B's that you can use for sure. For sure. Like, for example, uh, with experience as well, you start like, you know what to do with situations like this as well. So like in the beginning, you're like, oh, like it's not along with what I expected. With time, you feel okay because you have been in that situation before. So it also goes away. Yeah. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Cool. Good. And and in this, where is my, yeah, here it is. Um, so, so yeah, if there yeah. are not any more questions, I guess we can wrap up. Um, but yeah, thank you for uh, coming and sharing all of this. I think it was, yeah, so useful and helpful for all of us. And yeah, as I mentioned, also for me, just hearing all these things and things that we as community managers are struggling with. So yeah, thanks a lot for that. Uh, and I want to also thank for everybody who came and joined, who listened, um, make sure to um, connect with Juan LinkedIn uh, and yeah, his email and those websites are on the event page. We also have the recording from the event page. Um, and yeah, if you have also any questions for me, you can also connect with me on the email or LinkedIn. So. Yeah, but thank you, Juan, a lot for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, everybody, for joining. And uh, yeah, hope to see you around. Yes, yes. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Have a good one. Bye. Bye, everybody. Uh -oh.